The Bus Conductor by E. F. Benson. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Bus Conductor by E. F. Benson. My friend Hugh Granger and I had just returned from a two days' visit in the country, where we'd been staying in a house of sinister repute, which was supposed to be haunted by ghosts. Of a peculiarly fearsome and truculent sort. The house itself was all that such a house should be, Jacobean and oak panelled with long dark passages and high vaulted rooms. It stood also very remote and was encompassed by a wood of sombre pines that muttered and whispered in the dark. And all the time that we were there, a south westerly gale with torrents of scolding rain had prevailed, so that by day and night weird voices moaned and fluted in the chimneys. A company of uneasy spirits held colloquy among the trees, and sudden tattoos and tappings beckoned from the window panes. But in spite of these surroundings, which were sufficient in themselves, one would almost say, to spontaneously generate occult phenomena, nothing of any description had occurred. I am bound to add also that my own state of mind was peculiarly well adapted to receive or even to invent the sights and sounds we had gone to seek, for I was, I confess, during the whole time that we were there, in a state of abject apprehension, and lay awake both nights through hours of terrified unrest, afraid of the dark, yet more afraid of what a lighted candle might show me. Hugh Granger, on the evening after our return to town, had dined with me, and after dinner our conversation, as was natural, soon came back to these entrancing topics. "'But why you go ghost-seeking, I cannot imagine,' he said, because your teeth were chattering and your eyes starting out of your head all the time you were there, from sheer fright. Or do you like being frightened? Hugh, though generally intelligent, is dense in certain ways. This is one of them. Why, of course I like being frightened, I said. I want to be made to creep and creep and creep. Fear is the most absorbing and luxurious of emotions. One forgets all else if one is afraid. Well, the fact that neither of us saw anything, he said, confirms what I've always believed. And what have you always believed? That these phenomena are purely objective, not subjective, and that one's state of mind has nothing to do with the perception that perceives them, nor have the circumstances or surroundings anything to do with them either. Look at Osburton. It has had the reputation of being a haunted house for years, and it certainly has all the accessories of one. Look at yourself, too, with all your nerves on edge afraid to look round or light a candle for fear of seeing something. Surely there was the right man in the right place then, if ghosts are subjective. He got up and lit a cigarette, and looking at him, Hugh is about six feet high, and as broad as he is long. I felt a retort on my lips, for I could not help my mind going back to a certain period in his life, when, from some cause which as far as I knew he had never told anybody, he had become a mere quivering mass of disordered nerves. Oddly enough, at the same moment and for the first time, he began to speak of it himself. You may reply that it was not worth my while to go either, he said, because I was so clearly the wrong man in the wrong place. But I wasn't. You, for all your apprehensions and expectancy, have never seen a ghost. But I have, though I'm the last person in the world you would have thought likely to do so. And, though my nerves are steady enough again now, it knocked me all to bits. He sat down again in his chair. No doubt you remember my going to bits, he said. And since I believe that I am sound again now, I should rather like to tell you about it. But before, I couldn't. I couldn't speak of it at all to anybody. Yet there ought to have been nothing frightening about it. What I saw was certainly a most useful and friendly ghost. But it came from the shaded side of things. It looked suddenly out of the night, and the mystery with which life is surrounded. I want first to tell you quite shortly my theory about ghost-seeing, he continued, and I can explain it best by a simile, an image. Imagine, then, that you and I and everybody in the world are like people whose eye is directly opposite a little tiny hole in a sheet of cardboard which is continually shifting and revolving and moving about. Back to back with that sheet of cardboard is another, which also, by laws of its own, is in perpetual but independent motion. In it, too, there is another hole, and when, fortuitously, it would seem, these two holes, the one through which we are always looking, and the other in the spiritual plane, come opposite to one another, we see through, and then only do the sights and sounds of the spiritual world become visible or audible to us. With most people, these holes never come opposite each other during their life, but at the hour of death they do, and then they remain stationary. That, I fancy, is how we pass over. 
Now in some natures, these holes are comparatively large, and are constantly coming into opposition. Clairvoyants, mediums are like that. But as far as I know, I had no clairvoyant or mediumistic powers at all. I therefore am the sort of person who long ago made up his mind that he never would see a ghost. It was, so to speak, an incalculable chance that my minute spy-hole should come into opposition with the other, but it did, and it knocked me out of time. I'd heard some such theory before, and though Hugh put it rather picturesquely, there was nothing in the least convincing or practical about it. It might be so, or again, it might not. I hope your ghost was more original than your theory, said I, in order to bring him to the point. Yes, I think it was. You shall judge. I put on more coal and poked up the fire. Hugh has got, so I've always considered, a great talent for telling stories, and that sense of drama which is so necessary for the narrator. Indeed, before now I've suggested to him that he should take this up as a profession, sit by the fountain in Piccadilly Circus, when times are, as usual, bad, and tell stories to the passers-by in the street, Arabian fashion, for reward. The most part of mankind, I'm aware, do not like long stories, but to the few, among whom I number myself, who really like to listen to lengthy accounts of experiences, Hugh is an ideal narrator. I do not care for his theories, or for his similes, but when it comes to facts, to things that happened, I like him to be lengthy. Go on, please. And slowly, I said. Brevity may be the soul of wit, but it's the ruin of storytelling. I want to hear when and where, and how it all was, and what you had for lunch, and where you dined, and what... Hugh began. It was the 24th of June, just 18 months ago, he said. I had let my flat, you may remember, and come up from the country to stay with you for a week. We dined alone here. I could not help interrupting. Did you see the ghost here, I asked, in this square little box of a house in a modern street? I was in the house when I saw it. I hugged myself in silence. We dined alone here in Graham Street, he said, and after dinner I went out to some party, and you stopped at home. At dinner your man did not wait, and when I asked where he was, you told me he was ill, and I thought changed the subject rather abruptly. You gave me your latch key when I went out, and on coming back I found you had gone to bed. There were, however, several letters for me which required answers. I wrote them there and then, and posted them at the pillar box opposite, so I suppose it was rather late when I went upstairs. You'd put me in the front room, on the third floor overlooking the street, a room which I thought you generally occupied yourself. It was a very hot night, and though there had been a moon when I started to my party, on my return the whole sky was cloud-covered, and it both looked and felt as if we might have a thunderstorm before morning. I was feeling very sleepy and heavy, and it was not till after I got into bed that I noticed by the shadows of the window frames on the blind that only one of the windows was open. But it did not seem worth while to get out of bed in order to open it, though I felt rather airless and uncomfortable, and I went to sleep. What time it was when I awoke I do not know, but it was certainly not yet dawn, and I never remember being conscious of such an extraordinary stillness as prevailed. There was no sound, either of foot passengers or wheel traffic. The music of life appeared to be absolutely mute, but now, instead of being sleepy and heavy, I felt, though I must have slept an hour or two at most since it was not yet dawn, perfectly fresh and wide awake, and the effort which had seemed not worth making before, that of getting out of bed and opening the other window, was quite easy now, and I pulled up the blind, threw it wide open, and leaned out, for somehow I parched and pined for air. Even outside the oppression was very noticeable, and though, as you know, I am not easily given to feel the mental effects of climate, I was aware of an awful creepiness coming over me. I tried to analyse it away, but without success. The past day had been pleasant. I looked forward to another pleasant day tomorrow, and yet I was full of some nameless apprehension. I felt, too, dreadfully lonely in this stillness before the dawn. Then I heard suddenly, and not very far away, the sound of some approaching vehicle. I could distinguish the tread of two horses walking at a slow foot's pace. They were, though not yet visible, coming up the street, and yet this indication of life did not abate that dreadful sense of loneliness which I have spoken of. Also, in some dim unformulated way, that which was coming seemed to me to have something to do with the cause of my oppression. Then the vehicle came into sight. At first I could not distinguish what it was. Then I saw that the horses were black and had long tails, and that what they dragged was made of glass, but had a black frame. It was a hearse, empty. It was moving up this side of the street. It stopped at your door. Then the obvious solution struck me. 
You'd said at dinner that your man was ill, and you were, I thought, unwilling to speak more about his illness. No doubt, so I imagine now, he was dead, and for some reason, perhaps because you did not want me to know anything about it, you were having the body removed at night. This, I must tell you, passed through my mind quite instantaneously, and it did not occur to me how unlikely it really was, before the next thing happened. I was still leaning out of the window, and I remember also wondering, yet only momentarily, how odd it was that I saw things, or rather the one thing I was looking at, so very distinctly. Of course, there was a moon behind the clouds, but it was curious how every detail of the hearse and the horses was visible. There was only one man, the driver, with it, and the street was otherwise absolutely empty. It was at him I was looking now. I could see every detail of his clothes, but from where I was, so high above him, I could not see his face. He had on grey trousers, brown boots, a black coat buttoned all the way up, and a straw hat. Over his shoulder there was a strap, which seemed to support some sort of little bag. He looked exactly like, well, from my description, what did he look exactly like? Why, a bus conductor, I said instantly. So I thought, and even while I was thinking this, he looked up at me. He had a rather long, thin face, and on his left cheek there was a mole with a growth of dark hair on it. All this was as distinct as if it had been noonday, and as if I was within a yard of him. But, so instantaneous was all that takes so long in the telling, I had not time to think it so strange that the driver of a hearse should be so unfunereally dressed. Then he touched his hat to me, and jerked his thumb over his shoulder. "'Just room for one inside, sir,' he said. There was something so odious, so coarse, so unfeeling about this, that I instantly drew my head in, pulled the blind down again, and then, for what reason I do not know, turned on the electric light in order to see what time it was. The hands of my watch pointed to half-past eleven. It was then, for the first time, I think, that a doubt crossed my mind as to the nature of what I had just seen, but I put out the light again, got into bed and began to think. We had dined, I had gone to a party, I'd come back and written letters, had gone to bed and had slept. So how could it be half-past eleven, or what half-past eleven was it? Then another easy solution struck me. My watch must have stopped, but it had not. I could hear it ticking. There was stillness and silence again. I expected every moment to hear muffled footsteps on the stairs, footsteps moving slowly and smallly under the weight of a heavy burden. But from inside the house there was no sound whatever. Outside, too, there was the same dead silence while the hearse waited at the door, and the minutes ticked on and ticked on, and at length I began to see a difference in the light in the room, and knew that the dawn was beginning to break outside. But how had it happened, then, that if the corpse was to be removed at night, it had not gone, and that the hearse still waited, while morning was already coming? Presently I got out of bed again, and with a sense of strong physical shrinking, I went to the window and pulled back the blind. The dawn was coming fast. The whole street was lit by that silver hueless light of morning, but there was no hearse there. Once again I looked at my watch. It was just a quarter past four, but I would swear that not half an hour had passed since it had told me that it was half past eleven. Then a curious double sense, as if I was living in the present and at the same moment had been living in some other time, came over me. It was dawn on June 25th, and the street as natural was empty. But a little while ago, the driver of a hearse had spoken to me, and it was half-past eleven. What was that driver? To what plane did he belong? And again, what half-past eleven was it that I had seen recorded on the dial of my watch? And then I told myself that the whole thing had been a dream. But if you ask me whether I believed what I told myself, I must confess that I did not. Your man did not appear at breakfast next morning, nor did I see him again before I left that afternoon. I think if I had, I should have told you about all this. But it was still possible, you see, that what I'd seen was a real hearse, driven by a real driver, for all the ghastly gaiety of the face that had looked up to mine, and the levity of his pointing hand. I might possibly have fallen asleep soon after seeing him, and slumbered through the removal of the body and the departure of the hearse. So I did not speak of it to you. There was something wonderfully straightforward and prosaic in all this. Here were no Jacobean houses, oak-panelled and surrounded by weeping pine-trees, and somehow the very absence of suitable surroundings made the story more impressive. But for a moment a doubt assailed me. Don't tell me it was all a dream, I said. I don't know whether it was or not. I can only say that I believe myself to have been wide awake. In any case, the rest of the story is... odd. 
I went out of town again that afternoon, he continued, and I may say that I don't think that even for a moment did I get the haunting sense of what I had seen or dreamed that night out of my mind. It was present to me always as some vision unfulfilled. It was as if some clock had struck the four quarters, and I was still waiting to hear what the hour would be. Exactly a month afterwards, I was in London again, but only for the day. I arrived at Victoria about eleven, and took the underground to Sloane Square, in order to see if you were in town and would give me lunch. It was a baking hot morning, and I intended to take a bus from the King's Road as far as Graham Street. There was one standing at the corner just as I came out of the station, but I saw that the top was full, and the inside appeared to be full also. Just as I came up to it, the conductor, who I suppose had been inside collecting fares or what not, came out onto the step within a few feet of me. He wore grey trousers, brown boots, a black coat buttoned, a straw hat, and over his shoulder was a strap on which hung his little machine for punching tickets. I saw his face too. It was the face of the driver of the hearse, with a mole on the left cheek. Then he spoke to me, jerking his thumb over his shoulder. Just room for one inside, sir, he said. At that, a sort of panic terror took possession of me, and I knew I gesticulated wildly with my arms and cried, No, no! But at that moment, I was living not in the hour that was then passing, but in that hour which had passed a month ago, when I leaned from the window of your bedroom here, just before the dawn broke. At this moment, too, I knew that my spy-hole had been opposite the spy-hole into the spiritual world. What I had seen there had some significance, now being fulfilled beyond the significance of the trivial happenings of today and tomorrow. The powers of which we know so little were visibly working before me, and I stood there on the pavement, shaking and trembling. I was opposite the post office at the corner, and just as the bus started, my eye fell on the clock in the window there. I need not tell you what the time was. Perhaps I need not tell you the rest, for you probably conjecture it, since you will not have forgotten what happened at the corner of Sloan Square at the end of July, the summer before last. The bus pulled out from the pavement into the street in order to get round a van that was standing in front of it. At the moment there came down the King's Road a big motor going at a hideously dangerous pace. It crashed full into the bus, burrowing into it as a gimlet burrows into a board. He paused. And that's my story, he said. End of the Bus Conductor by E. F. Benson